Well, we're going to carry on talking about kingdom. And I want to talk today about living delicious. Does that sound good? Living delicious. I'm speaking specifically about living delicious lives that stick out in this life. And we've been um, on this route together talking kingdom and looking afresh and redefining what it means kingdom come. Because we know that Jesus says that when he's instructing us how we should pray. And when you pray, say, our Father who art in heaven. But then he says, kingdom come, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we've been redefining and reintroducing ourselves to the fact that yes, there's an expression of kingdom come one day, many days from now. When Jesus returns to collect what belongs to him, which is his church, his people, in that day, yep, certainly kingdom will come. But I think that's not going to change the world, that understanding. What's going to change the world is when we realise kingdom has come. But when Jesus Christ came that first time 2,000 years ago, a king was born and a kingdom was brought into being. Not into buildings, but into the lives of people. But the kingdom of God is among us today. Even better than that, the Bible says that the kingdom of God is within us. And this is where we've been journeying the last few weeks. I don't want to take ages to recap because I know people have been in and out. Some are working, some have been away. Good news, all you need to do is click family.church. No orgs, co's, dot uk's, comms, just family.church. And you can watch all of the previous messages that have been uploaded. And that's good news. That's a great resource, isn't it? Because I want to concentrate now on the kingdom coming from us, being released from the lives of those who are citizens of it. We've shared over the last couple of weeks that we've realized that it wasn't just the coming of a king 2,000 years ago, but the coming of his kingdom. Wherever there's a king, there's a kingdom. Wherever there's a kingdom, there's a king. You don't replace one or do less by one if you focus on one because they're both the same, right? So we acknowledged that the entrance into the kingdom of God is only through the king. That no one can be born again unless they come through Christ. No one can come to the Father but through Christ. He's the doorway to the Father and the kingdom. But the the kingdom's open to anyone. All you need to do is place your faith in Jesus Christ. But then we established that it wasn't just about us finding a king at salvation. It was about us, even if we were unaware, coming into a new kingdom that didn't come into existence when we die physically, but came into existence the moment we believed. So what we've been laying the platform is, Lord, give us a greater understanding that we are now citizens of your kingdom in this life. And that your kingdom is now resident in us, in this life. Because many Christians, they have a I'll fly away, oh glory kind of theology. Which means that they're just going to struggle through this life. But one day they're going to die and they'll fly away. And everything in heaven will be so much better. Yeah, now there is a reality that after this life there's heaven or hell. But there's also a reality But when we get to heaven one day, we shouldn't really be too much different to how we've been here. Unless we think that the kingdom of God is about what happens far, far away and not about what happens on the earth today. Where the reality is, if we want to change the world, we've got to do something we haven't been doing because we haven't saved it yet. Maybe the missing understanding isn't the understanding of the king and salvation that comes through him, but rather the understanding that we are kingdom people now. And we carry the kingdom of God now. And we can release the kingdom of God in all its deliciousness now. Not by our preaching alone, but by our living Because you see, there's a difference between the church and the kingdom. Now, they're both the same, they're connected, I understand that. But the church, which we put our focus on, meetings, services, two hours a week on Sunday, 
The church is actually very young. It's only 2,000 years old. But the kingdom's eternal. It's always been around since the beginning of whatever the beginning was because it's God's kingdom. When we're born again, we're not born into church attendance. We're born into a kingdom that should affect our lives, not on Sunday morning, but all week. This kingdom that we're a part of should affect our marriages, should affect how we handle our finances, how we forgive, how we respond to things. But it won't unless we recognize that we are now, not one day far, far away, now citizens of his kingdom here on earth. Like I've been sharing the last couple of weeks, you must understand that your second birth citizenship trumps your first one. Doesn't matter if you were born in England, America, Asia, whatever continent, whatever nation. That's great that you have a celebration of your natural ancestry or birth or citizenship. But for us, if we're going to live kingdom lives, we've got to say, yeah, 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 that's good. But firstly, I'm a kingdom person. My life is joined to his kingdom and his kingdom is in me. So I'm going to now live true to the grain of his kingdom and not the grain of another kingdom if it disagrees or is contrary to his. It's really not difficult, but it is about submission. And sometimes for people, submission is difficult. But when you realize what an incredible king he is, I believe you gladly bow your knee. I don't believe that Jesus has to force a knee to be bowed because he's altogether wonderful. So, okay, we've come to this conclusion that living out kingdom is about the choices we make, not on Sunday morning for two hours, but in every moment of our lives. Will we now live true to the grain of his kingdom that we're a part of and is a part of us? Or will we continue business as usual as if nothing has happened in our citizenship and we're actually the same as what we were before except for two hours on Sunday and connect group if you go once a week? Listen, obviously the answer is we live differently. But we now release the ways of this kingdom that we're a part of. And this is all the early church knew. Yet, I'm sure you agree the early church was very effective in changing the world. Because it wasn't about their preaching, you see. It wasn't about their meetings, because actually I'm having trouble reading the book of Acts to see when they actually did have a meeting. But they were living kingdom lives. And the kingdom lives that they were living was a message that shocked the world. Because it was a different way of living. As the world watched the early church, they saw people that loved differently, had different value systems, forgave differently. They were the most employable people. Sadly, sometimes today, the last person you want to employ is a Christian because they turn up late and don't finish. What, you know, come on, we've got we to gotta begin to realize that the kingdom people live better. But we won't unless we realize we're kingdom people. Okay, so... They lived lives that stood out, not because they were weirdos, but because they were committed to another way of living. And that was the kingdom way. Do you know that Christians actually really weren't called Christians 2,000 years ago? We we say, hey, we're Christians and we're believers. They were actually considered, and this is interesting, a cult or a sect. Now today when we speak about a cult, except for if you're in France, it's it's acceptable terminology, but in England, you speak about cult, you think, oh no, widows, cult, sect. But the early church were considered a sect because they lived so differently to the religious. Not immorally, but differently. They lived a delicious life. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees lived in hypocrisy, religion, legalism, But then suddenly there was this group of people that were followers of this man Jesus and they lived lives, not just preached well, but they lived lives that were delicious. And people said, whatever you're on, I want it. Listen, that's where we have to go in our thinking. 
It's not about meetings and services. Our meetings and our services need to be merely expressions of who we are seven days a week. Otherwise, we're a bunch of phonies. Right? Okay, thank you for that underwhelming response. It just made me want to preach even harder. So they were actually salt and light, just like Jesus calls us to be. Let me read to you in Matthew 5 what Jesus said about who we are now, not who we will be. It says in verse 13, you are, present tense, the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown away and trampled by men. You are also the light of the world. You're a city on a hill that cannot and should not be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl or hide it. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds, the way that you live out your life and praise your Father in heaven for who you are and the way that you live. So, okay, now this brings us into an understanding of two things. Jesus was still teaching kingdom. He says that kingdom people should be salt in the world. What does salt do? It purifies, but also it brings flavor, doesn't it? I believe that kingdom people, you and me, should actually bring a new flavor to life that's delicious. Now, I have the privilege of eating around many people's homes and uh, I believe in the ministry of Jesus when he used to just say to people, today I'm coming to your house to eat. I like to work in that ministry, it works for me. It's just difficult when you say, oh that's me, my wife and five children and one of them six and a half foot tall. Actually people are a little bit less receptive to that. You know, Jesus just being a single man, it worked well, you know. Anyway, don't distract me, you're disturbing me now. So Jesus said, you know, we've got to be salt. Now, I've gone and eaten food that's been very tasty and food that's been, well, let's just leave it at that. And sometimes when you're eating food, you say, this just needs seasoning. Everything's kind of there, but you just need to add some salt to bring out the flavor here. It's amazing that that's comparable, I think, to life. But life without God is very bland. But the moment you add God, it's like salt comes in. But I believe that Christians, we should be the salt of the world. But when we turn up with a different way of living, a different way of loving, a different way of forgiving, a different way of caring, a different way of handling finance, a different way of running our family, a different way of raising our children, if it's different to the way the world teaches, our life should be such a flavor-giving thing. We should make life delicious. And that's before we even preach. But it also says we're the light of the world, which means when we've become born again, we've come into a kingdom, a kingdom's come into us. In other words, he lit us up. So the worst thing that we should do now that we've been lit up is put something over our lives or pretend we're not a light. But rather, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Anybody remember that one? Okay. I know we're dealing with a generation that may never have heard those beautiful songs. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. How am I going to let it shine? I'm not going to cover my life or pretend I'm not a kingdom person. Because light will always confound darkness. You don't need a lot of light to remove darkness. You just need uh, the striking of a match can dispel a room full of darkness. What if we as kingdom people stopped putting the emphasis on the expression of kingdom, which is church meetings, and said we will be kingdom Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We will always ask what would the kingdom do? How would the kingdom respond to this? I think then without even trying, because we, repra- we always in church replace lifestyle for projects, always. Well, let's have evangelism projects. Let's go out on the street with a guitar two hours a week. No, let's not. Let's train people to live kingdom lives so that their lives become display boards, not just of a king, but of a better way of living in this life. Is that good? I think I'm preaching better than the first service. What do you reckon, Stu? It is, eh? It is. I'm feeling I'm doing all right this morning. I am, this afternoon. 
So here we go. It rises and falls on our citizenship. If we don't know that we're born of another kingdom, that we've now been born from above, we'll continue business as usual, living true to the grain of a kingdom that we knew before Christ. But what we need to do is now realise, no, we're going to live true to the grain of a kingdom that we've been born again into. And as we do, without big announcements, our lives will declare his glory and his kingdom to those who are amongst us. Now, it's a new way of living. Now, you may say to me, this sounds like a new world order. Hmm, I thought that, but then actually I thought that's an insult to the creator. This isn't a new world order. This is an original world order. Because God made everything, you see, and when he made everything, he wired everything with his kingdom. We went into rebellion and left the ways of his kingdom. And actually, when we're born again, we just come back to the original and true way of living, which was always his way of living. I'm really good at making simple things difficult, right? Or maybe difficult things simple. Let's see what Jesus prayed over us, his disciples, 2,000 years ago. Because it's interesting because a lot of Christians are just kind of existing and they're waiting to die before they have some any joy or happiness. Oh, one day I'll be in heaven. I actually want to walk into heaven and go, oh, it's so good to see my mum. So good to see those that went before me. But the way I'm going to live isn't going to be any different because I bowed my knee to him on earth. I served him on earth. I loved him on earth. I lived by his ways or endeavoured to live by his ways on earth. So actually, me being present in heaven, it's just another day. Something to think about, right? So this is what Jesus prays over his disciples. John 17, verse 15. Listen, to what, listen, this is the words of Jesus. My prayer, he's talking to his father. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify, separate them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world... I have sent them into the world. Isn't that interesting? So maybe kingdom life doesn't begin when we die. Otherwise, after salvation, he would have took us home. Maybe his purpose isn't to take us home, but to let his home be manifest through us. Maybe he's not sending us to heaven. He's actually sending us into the world. By the world, I don't mean the far shores of the mission field. I'm talking about work tomorrow morning. College. The way we live out our lives, I think, is where kingdom should be displayed. Happy birthday, Matt Lockwood. I haven't said that yet. Happy birthday. Matt Lockwood's birthday. It didn't really fit there. I just thought, if I don't say it now, I'll forget. But, you know, so happy birthday to the world that are watching Matt Lockwood's birthday. So Jesus is saying, you're not of the world, but you're in it. And he says that to us too. So if we could reconsider that we're not actually of this place anymore, we're just in it, that will determine how we live out our lives to the glory of God. So we have a choice to make. Now do we realize that we're of another kingdom here on earth? We look at the life of Christ and the teachings of Christ to see what is living true to the grain of the kingdom. You see, Jesus didn't live by the rules of his kingdom. The kingdom was him, and he was the kingdom. When Jesus forgave, when Jesus loved, he wasn't performing, he was living true of the realm that he represented. So when we look at the life of Christ, we don't even need to read his words. We see the embodiment of another way of living here on earth. And actually, when you look at the way that Jesus lived out his life, he didn't repulse or repel people, did he? You know, so many people today are running away from church. And I'm thinking, well, what are we doing wrong? Because when I read my Bible, they had to have crowd control. People couldn't keep away from him. And he never compromised once. He never came down to anyone's level to relate to them but he always lifted them to his level, 
to give them a better life. So we don't sink down and compromise to reach the world. We just live out a better way of living based on how he lived and how he taught to live. And you say, well, I can't. Yes, you can. You've got the Holy Spirit in you. If you didn't have the Holy Spirit in you, you would have, you've got no chance at all. You just become a hypocrite pretending. But he placed his spirit in us to enable us and empower us to live kingdom life. Without the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't do anything more than what we could do before. But how many people have got the Holy Spirit? Then God's given you the ability to live a new way of living. Okay, I want to focus just on one aspect of kingdom living today. And uh, it's actually a huge one because I could skip through them, forgiveness, servanthood, um, loving. But this one I really think is key and will cause a reaction in your life when we talk about it. How do I know that? Because it caused one in mine. But when we look at living true to the grain of the kingdom, there's certain moments where how Jesus says we should live is very different to what we've experienced in the life that we have lived. At that moment, we make our choice to be kingdom people, right? Now, I've got this one. I'm hesitating a little bit because some of you will probably hate me when I say what it is. Well, you can't because the Bible says you're not allowed to, but you may anyway because, you know, people do. Do you know that one of the key aspects of kingdom is prefer others? How different, how countercultural is that to the life that we've experienced? Now, don't get me wrong, there's good people saved and unsaved in this life. The, you know, it's not just about being kingdom, because I know some people aren't saved and they live better lives than those that say they are. But when it comes generally to the way of life that we've been born into, it doesn't really prefer others, does it? It pushes in front of the queue. It puts the person first. It's what about me? It's am I okay? Am I taken care of? How do I feel about that? And the well-being of someone else becomes not third, but second. Yet the kingdom of God says, you want delicious living? Then you enter into a new way of living called prefer others. And it's actually not a random statement in the Bible. It's throughout. Here's a few verses. I want to read to you from 2 Philippians. 2 Philippians. There's only one Philippians. Just trying to catch you out, see if you're reading your Bibles. Philippians chapter 2. It's like there's no first book of imaginations. That's not in there. Some of you are like, really? No, no. No, it's not. So Philippians chapter 2. It says, verse 3, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility always consider or prefer others better than yourself. Each of you should not look to your own interests but also to the interests of other people. And it says in doing this, verse 5, our attitude then becomes like the attitude of Christ. How different is that way of living to what you may have experienced? But we have a choice. Are we going to live kingdom now? But we're aware of the difference. Again, I'd love to say it was a one-off statement, but it's really not. It's actually a theme that I believe is one of the kingdom principles called the golden rule, which is treat others as you would have them treat you. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I know that some people can't love their neighbor because they don't love themselves, but that's a different message. But the Bible says the kingdom way of life is we say, would I like someone to do that for me? Then let me be the one that sows the seed for doing it to them. Romans 12.10 it says that we should be preferring one another. Uh, Philippians 2, we've read, esteem others better than yourself. Isn't this delicious living? Can you imagine living in a world where people put others first? First Thessalonians, be edifying each other, not tearing each other down. Galatians 5.13, it says, use the liberty you found in Christ to serve one another. Imagine how our lives would deliciously stick out 
in a self-centered, self-preservation world, if suddenly we said, you know what, I'm sick of living like that, let me begin to live kingdom and begin to put others in front of me more than I ever have before. Again, the Holy Spirit enables us to do that, but he really will. So again, it leaves us with a choice. We can change the world if we live differently. If preaching does it, we would have changed the world by now. So maybe we need to deliver the kingdom from being restricted to church services to being the lives that we choose to live. And then on Sundays, we manifest the kingdom in our praise and our worship and our gathering together. Because I think otherwise, we just make it an organization or a place that meets once a week. And the kingdom is bigger than that. Like a mustard seed, it comes small, but its agenda is to possess the totality of who you are for your good, not your harm. So, okay, I've got a bit of a challenge some of you will hate. And I'm only passing on to you what God passed on to me. I always try to, if the Lord gives me something that's a bit of a struggle, I'm like, let me share it. Let me share it. I'm a generous man. Like Paul said, I pass on to you what the Lord passed on to me. I believe that we could actually change road rage and the worldwide or national-wide problem with traffic fury if enough kingdom people said, I'm going to be a kingdom person driving a car. Bear with me, I told you you wouldn't like it. Because if prefer others hits every aspect of who we are, we could well change the atmosphere around us. You say, oh, you're getting carried away now. Oh, you may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. Because you see, this week was an interesting experiment. It's actually lasted about two weeks now, where I felt the Lord say to me, okay, big math, so you're going to live kingdom, are you? Yes, I am, Lord. So is kingdom going to be in every area of your life? Ah, oh, yes, Lord, absolutely. I'm a kingdom person now. Bruh. All right, then let it affect your driving. No, no, no. That's not spiritual. And so all of a sudden, and I just wonder to my embarrassment, I don't mind now because I'm forgiven. Admit that I was one of these people, whenever I came to a junction, I entered into the game of I don't see you. You're not there. I know you're waving to get into my gap, but I also know I queued. And I know just because you've got a Mercedes, you don't think you can queue. I go, no, no, I'm not looking. You're not there. You're not there till I acknowledge you. And this is my gap. And you wouldn't, no, no, especially if you're a taxi driver. I mean, it's like when Jesus met, the, you know, it says there was a guy in trouble and he was a Samaritan. He took it to another level. I'm talking about letting people in and taxi drivers. I mean, it's going somewhere that some would never go. But it's amazing. All of a sudden, I felt the Lord say, why don't you just let him in? And so, again, I want terrible. I want like some people I know. I just, when I feel like it. But that's the problem with the kingdom of God is if people just live it when they feel like it. And so I really felt the Lord saying to me, go on, let him in. And it was amazing because normally I would enter the realm of rage internally because I wouldn't let them in. Nobody knows what I'm talking about, right? No one. You're looking at me like, oh, surely not. No one, right? I'm up here on my own then, right? Okay, be like that. Get them, Lord. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so I'm in the traffic and all of a sudden, something changed. So I went, let's just let them in. Oh, on. I don't know where you come from. Maybe you're going to miss an appointment and get the sack. I don't know. Go on. Hey, you, maybe you had a rough day and I can make you go on. It's just go on. Now, I couldn't manage the fury behind me because everybody didn't want to live in my revelation. And I was relative. I didn't let, you know, because sometimes it's, and I just, no, normally I would let one in because that's, that's kingdom. Two, three, come on. 
Go on, hey, I'm looking at you. Yeah, I'm not ignoring you. Love you. Go on, go on. Go on. You, you. I'm, my, okay, okay, thank you. And I think I changed roundabouts at Cosham. I changed them. Flowers began to grow. People began to sing. This is what was happening in my, my mind. And I added up that in the biggest traffic jams, you know what I probably gave away if you take on speeds and catch up and other traffic lights? I probably gave away two seconds of my life. But I lived differently. How did I live differently? I preferred others. And said, yeah, no, I'm in this, but I want to make sure that you're okay. Imagine, we could end road rage. People would run to the back of their boot to get a crowbar and go, but I've got nobody to hit. I've got no one to hit. What am I going to do? Oh, I'll put my crowbar back. We could change driving in England if enough kingdom people said, I'm going to let kingdom life even hit my driving. Just saying. In fact, I'm not just saying. I've got a challenge for every driver this week. If you drive a car, if you don't, you got off of this one, but we'll get you next time. But if you're a driver or you're next to a driver, I want to challenge you this week to let as many people out as you can and listen to your soul when you're doing it. Some of you are like, that's not nice to look at your pastor like that. Seriously. Some of those looks, seriously. You go and give yourself a good talking to, young lady, young man. So this week, we're going to have an experiment. We're going to live differently as we drive. We're going to let people in. Give away places. I'm just begging the Holy Spirit that I don't have a bad day and you're in it when it happens. Like, oh, big mouth, I thought you were... I'm just, I'm just, you know, accountability. But I want you to see that preferring others is a better way of living. It doesn't really cost you, it adds to them. And it just releases a delicious way of living. Because before I was Mr. I can't see you, and I had all this irritation inside about, but what are they thinking? What if I accidentally see them? And suddenly I'm running through the fields like, oh, I love you. It's brilliant. Even with taxi drivers, because they can challenge you. Because in America, you've got open roads and no one has to give way. When Americans watch how we drive, they like, you, you guys are awesome. We have to pull into a gap, let one through and give them a customary hand wave. If they don't, we're like, yeah, what's wrong with you? You know, I mean, we've got this way of driving, haven't we? Let them through, it's my turn. Bigger one comes first. I was on the junction. We have all these rules that aren't in the highway code, but then we go at the end. But I even found within myself, I didn't mind going like that until I saw the taxi sticker on the side and went, oh, oh, yeah, I should just put No! It's wrong, I repent before thee. They are people too. <laughs> anyway, moving on. So there's your challenge. If you haven't got a car, look at how else it could affect the place in the queue at the supermarket. Wherever we would naturally say, me first. Let's believe that the kingdom's going to break out this week. Not because we have to, but just that we want to be a part of a more delicious way of living than that. And as we do, we represent God well. Amen. So if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, it's not just an invitation to know the salvation of a king, but also to come into a kingdom. In this life, there's a better way to live. I'm going to follow this on next week. I'm not in a hurry. I've got another thought on my heart that'll upset people next week challenge you to live this kingdom life because I want to I want to live this kingdom life I want the kingdom to define how I should live because I think that's living my best life now if you're here and you've never given your life to Christ if you've never come into his kingdom maybe you've been away and you say it's time for me to come back that's simple one prayer one acknowledgement Let's just pray this together. Jesus, you are the King. You are the Saviour. I come through you into everlasting life.
beyond the grave and here and now. Thank you, Jesus. You are my saviour. And today you save me. I come into your kingdom. And your kingdom comes into me. It grows. Changes everything. I receive you, Jesus. It's my every eyes closed, every head's bowed. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, you've been away from the Lord. You just need to reaffirm your relationship or your love with him. As I count to three, I'm going to ask you if that's you, just to lift your hand. Not going to embarrass you. I'm here to connect you. If that's you, as I count to three, just go ahead and lift your hand. One, two, three. Anybody here today and you say, I don't know where I stand with God. I want to know that me and God are right. Just going to wait. I know most are running with God and loving God, but just in case there's someone here that isn't, you can change it all this morning. You can change it all. Father, we thank you for kingdom living. Lord, I pray this week in my life and in the life of your church, we would feel the prompting of your spirit to just go ahead and live differently, to love differently, to forgive differently, to prefer others differently. And as we do, Lord, we live out of a Christ-likeness that makes you look as good as you really are. Lord, I just speak blessing on every family every household. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.